All right, so we're on lesson six. This is the last lesson of chapter two, which we'll be finishing today. Uh, in this lesson, we're going to talk a little bit about a couple of other cycles, the nitrogen and the phosphorus cycles. And we're going to talk about an idea called productivity, uh, which isn't necessarily related to one cycle specifically, but is kind of uh, a collection of all of the cycles together. Uh, so this is lesson six. So we're going to start by talking about the nitrogen cycle. In the nitrogen cycle, the thing we have to remember is that nitrogen is a really important element in proteins. In fact, nitrogen was the thing that you could use to distinguish uh, an amino acid, let's say, uh, from the other types of macromolecule subunits because the, it was the only one that had nitrogen in it. So the first thing I'd like you to think of, and we'll just pause here for a second. Uh, so I've heard a few at the very least. Uh, so as I walked around, I saw proteins act as enzymes. And that was the function of proteins that we focused on the most, because we needed to know how enzymes function. I heard people say, structural, and I did hear people say uh, contractile, <clears throat> uh, meaning that proteins are partially responsible for muscle contraction. Uh, now, did anyone have other things on their list for what proteins do? Yes, go. Immunity, Immunity absolutely. So we know that cellular immunity is based on proteins called antibodies and antigens. Yes. Transport. Transport. For example, hemoglobin, which transports oxygen and CO2. Anybody else got any more? Uh, I'll give you another one. Hormones. For example, insulin, glucagon. Uh, what are we missing on here? I think we are missing storage. Uh, so proteins <clears throat> can store things. For example, metals. Metals can be stored. Uh, there's also a couple of proteins uh, that were mentioned in the thing we did way at the beginning that would be found in a fetus. Uh, that if there's albumin, which is a protein. Uh, if you have ever eaten an egg, you have eaten albumin. It's a protein that stores stuff uh, in a developing egg. Uh, and then we also need receptor here. Uh, now, we didn't delve into the receptor part a ton, but if you take bio 30, one of the things that you'll discuss in great detail is hormones and how hormones work. And for hormones to bring a signal to another cell, something has to be there at that cell accepting them so that they can deliver their message. Uh, and proteins frequently accomplish this function. Uh, so this is why the nitrogen cycle is so important, because a ton of functions that are required for life depend on proteins, and proteins depend on nitrogen. Uh, so what is the usable form of nitrogen? And by usable, we mean the form that organisms can absorb, the form that they can take up. The usable form is in the form of nitrates. Nitrate is a polyatomic ion. Its formula is NO3 negative. And that is generally the form that is accessible to organisms. Other forms that are sort of usable or absorbable is the ammonium ion. Now, <clears throat> not necessarily for us, we don't want ammonium, but a lot of uh, organisms, say, that are living in soil can access ammonium or use ammonium, especially decomposers. So that's the usable form. That is the form, let's say, that will help that little seed germinate and grow and become a plant. Uh, a thing that I like to mention uh, to everybody uh, is something about fertilizer. 
If you've ever looked at a bag of fertilizer, fertilizer has three numbers on the bag. Uh, so, you know, it'll look something like that. Uh, and the numbers on the bag, you might remember learning at some point, represent N, P, and K, typically, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. So on a bag of fertilizer, the first number is telling you how much nitrogen there is in the fertilizer because nitrogen is absolutely necessary for a plant to grow because nitrogen is what proteins are made out of and my plant can't get bigger if it can't create more proteins. Uh, so fertilizer, the first number represents how much nitrogen we're adding to the soil. Uh, and so nitrogen is really essential for the growth of plants. Now this is all fine and dandy except that the major storab f storage form in the atmosphere is just nitrogen gas. That's not the same thing. Does anybody know or remember how much of our atmosphere nitrogen represents? So oxygen's like 20, 21 percent of our atmosphere. That's what we actually want to breathe in. Nitrogen represents somewhere in the neighborhood of 78 percent of our atmosphere. So a huge majority of our atmosphere is nitrogen gas, which even if it went into our lungs, and it does every day, we can't absorb and we can't use. So something has to happen to get this usable form from this nitrogen gas that our atmosphere is just chock full of. Uh, and so that's what the nitrogen cycle is basically going to be about. How are we changing nitrogen from its storage form to its usable form? Uh, so this is a picture of the nitrogen cycle. Uh, I'm showing it to you so that you can see that it really is a cycle. If you happen to want a picture of the nitrogen cycle, you're welcome to print this slide of notes. I will not ask you to draw pictures. Uh, you are welcome to say, put words and arrows. Uh, and I'm going to talk about each section of the picture uh, that has some details that we need to know about. Uh, so the first part of the picture that I'm going to talk about is this part. Where I go from nitrogen in the atmosphere to something else. So the first step of the nitrogen cycle that I have listed down here is nitrogen fixation. Nitrogen fixation is the process that takes that N2 gas and converts it. It will convert it very typically into some more usable form of nitrogen. It could be a nitrate, it could be ammonium, depending on where it actually is. So in this sense, fixation doesn't mean that we're repairing the nitrogen. Fixation means that we are adding nitrogen to something else. We're attaching them together. Now, what type of organisms accomplish this? Generally, there are bacteria that are found on the roots of a type of plant called a legume. It's kind of a funny English word because in French the word legume means vegetable, uh, but in English the word legume means things that are in like the bean category generally. Other plants that have this bacteria include a plant called clover. Uh, so I put a picture of a four-leaf clover over here representing that. The other thing that can accomplish nitrogen fixation is lightning. Now obviously lightning is not something that's super reliable uh, and so these bacteria that 
live on the roots of plants would be a much more predictable and reliable way to get nitrogen converted from N2 in the atmosphere to some more usable, readily accessible form. The second thing that I'd like to talk about is over on this side of the picture. And it's the opposing process. It is taking whatever usable form I had of nitrogen and converting it back into atmospheric nitrogen. So this is called denitrification. And this is where we take our nitrates and we go back to N2 gas. Bacteria are usually accomplishing this as well. Now you might ask yourself, if we can't use that form of nitrogen, why on earth would there be bacteria whose sole job is to accomplish this conversion? And it's because we want the cycle to keep continuing. If matter stops cycling, uh, then it stops moving, it stops changing, and it stops being easily accessible to organisms. Uh, the third thing on my list is the word ammonification. Like its name suggests, this is where we make ammonia out of something. So ammonification means taking one of those forms of nitrogen and making ammonia. Again, there are bacteria that can accomplish this. The fourth thing that I would like to add is decomposition. So decomposition, you can see happening in the middle of the picture. Animals and plants and really any living organism is leading to the decomposer, which is generally fungi or bacteria. In decomposition, we take proteins and turn them into nitrates, which are easy to absorb. So we're breaking down the proteins that living organisms were made of and putting their components back into the soil. Fungi or bacteria do this. The opposite, really, of decomposition is process number five, assimilation. In assimilation, you see the arrow going back up to the plants. This is where plants take proteins that got decomposed in the soil into nitrates and then make new proteins out of them again. So assimilation is really protein synthesis. And we would generally, generally say that plants are the part of the cycle that are accomplishing this because they are taking up the nitrates from the soil and then making proteins out of them. Now, I already mentioned lightning because uh, it's one of the subcategories of nitrogen fixation. Uh, so I'll jump right ahead to the last thing, eutrophication. Now, eutrophication is not a step of the cycle. Eutrophication uh, is an example of what can go wrong in the cycle. Eutrophication is when I have, like this picture is illustrating, a pretty big collection of excess nitrogen. In eutrophication, you have excess nitrogen in water. This leads to excess plant growth, which will eventually lead to death. And you might think that that's a pretty big jump, saying that plants will grow and then everything will die. Does anybody know why plants growing in excess in water would cause death? Yes. 
that would definitely be one of the things. So, there would be less oxygen. And you might say, mm, no, you're wrong. Plants make oxygen. What are you talking about? You're a crazy person. But there, plants also use oxygen. Let's not forget that. They need to do cell respiration. The other reason that there would be less oxygen uh, would often be because plants generally exist at the surface of water. And so if there are plants covering the surface of water, there is less chance for exchange between the atmosphere and water. That could also mean less sunlight because now the surface of the water is covered with plants. The things that are below the surface don't have access to sunlight. Uh, and so those are a couple of the reasons that excess plant growth could cause death. So, what might cause excess nitrogen in water? Fertilizer. Fertilizer would be the number one thing that we do that is causing this. It could be what you would call natural fertilizer. So when farmers spread manure over their land, that's fertilizer. But it still contains a lot of nitrogen in it. Or it could be adding fertilizer that was chemically uh, altered or man-made. How would fertilizer get into the water? Well, that's where the water cycle would come in runoff, percolation, so it would get into the groundwater potentially. Uh, it could rain a lot. If you have ever heard the term algal bloom, this would be an example of this process happening. Have any of you ever heard that before, algal bloom? It's when algae grow out of control uh, and having excess nitrogen is a very common reason that algal bloom could happen. So we have the nitrogen cycle. The phosphorus cycle uh, has a couple of components in common with the nitrogen cycle. One of them is eutrophication. Uh, it, you will also see assimilation in that cycle. Uh, so before we go there, uh, does anyone want to ask any questions about the parts uh, of the nitrogen cycle? Uh, so the phosphorus cycle, which will be what we'll finish with today, uh, this picture, uh, this identical picture, so that you know, is on page 50 of your textbook. So it's exactly this picture. Uh, and there are a couple of things uh, about phosphorus that you should know. First of all, why do we care about phosphorus? Well, phosphorus is a key component of cell membranes. Cell membranes are made up of a phospholipid bilayer. So that is what the edge of the cell membrane is made of. So of course, phosphorus is important there. Phosphorus is important for the growth and development of bones and teeth. And since ATP is adenosine triphosphate, of course, phosphorus is incredibly important for energy because that is what ATP is made out of. So those are all reasons that we care about the phosphorus cycle. One of the things that I want you to notice in the phosphorus cycle, and I'm going to point it out now, is there is never any phosphorus gas in the phosphorus cycle. Phosphorus does not exist as a gas naturally as part of its cycle. Uh, I wrote P4 because that's phosphorus's formula. It's one of the elements on the periodic table that instead of having a 2 has a different number. But it does not exist as a gas. That doesn't mean that the atmosphere uh, doesn't have an influence on the phosphorus cycle, but phosphorus doesn't exist in the atmosphere. So in the phosphorus cycle, I would start with weathering and erosion. This takes phosphorus from rocks, 
and generally puts it into water. Uh, and so if we had to sort of put a beginning to the phosphorus cycle, this is where it would start. Rain or sleet or hail or some sort of precipitation, some sort of weather will cause erosion of rocks. The phosphorus that was in those rocks will then be part of water. Runoff, like we saw in the water cycle, is surface water. And runoff could take phosphorus towards plants, towards animals, or towards larger bodies of water. So the runoff from the stream at the top is taking phosphorus all over the place. Now, organisms are going to use some of that phosphorus. Uh, one of the things that can happen uh, in addition to weathering is decomposition. So decomposition takes phosphorus from organisms and puts it into the soil. Now since, as sort of a general rule, animals don't eat the soil, they eat something that lives in the soil, assimilation is when a plant absorbs phosphorus from the soil and incorporates it. So just like uh, in the nitrogen cycle, assimilation was when we were making a protein out of some kind of nitrate that we absorbed from the soil. Assimilation in the phosphorus cycle is where the plant absorbs phosphorus from the soil and then incorporates it into, let's say, for example, ATP. That's not the only thing that the plant is doing with it, but that would be an example of a molecule where it's taking what it absorbed from the soil and doing something with it. Uh, now, in the phosphorus cycle, I put the word eutrophication again, uh, and I don't have anything new to say about eutrophication, except to remind you that fertilizer is made up generally of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. So if I have excess fertilizer, not only do I have excess nitrogen, but I very probably have excess phosphorus as well. The other source is in a lot of types of soap or cleaning products. In fact, you might notice on uh, soap, especially things like dish soap and stuff like that these days, that they'll specifically write phosphate-free uh, to indicate that there is not excess phosphate in it. Uh, but other than maybe soap being a slightly different source, eutrophication is the same principle. Uh, over here I have a picture to illustrate eutrophication. It's an experimental lake. Uh, you might not even realize that this green, disgusting-looking part down here is part of the lake. Uh, so there's a barrier, and on one side of the barrier, they've added excess phosphorus, and on the other side, they haven't. And you can see that on the bottom part where there's excess phosphorus, it's just covered. It's green, because uh, that's algae. So that's a picture to illustrate the algal bloom that can happen uh, because of excess nutrients being found in the water. 